Hello everyone, today we talk about Germany and the Empire during the 13th century, talking mostly about the uh, extinction of the Swabian House and the Great Interregnum, the rise of the Habsburgs and of princely Germany. We never made a video specifically on that, uh, let's say, on this specific time and, you know, protagonists, let's say. So this is just a general introduction, then we will go more in depth. Uh, over time. In this phase that is of excruciating importance for medieval history, for medieval Europe, medieval Germany, um, and that defined, in fact, much of the characters that also the modern country would inherit uh, in the following centuries. Um, and that, as you know, and I think we have explained this enough, but we will talk more about the German 13th century in detail, in fact, much again the uh, German national monarchy, like the the English or the French one, failed, right? And this was a, a big deal for for a number of reasons. First of all, because objectively, under the Hohenstaufen in the second half of the 12th century, uh, Germany had risen effectively as the largest power uh, in Western Europe, and as such, it went pretty damn close to reuniting East and West. Right, think many things stood in the way, mostly the papacy, but also the same German princes, uh, the, the the Lombard League, and uh, the broader international situation. And uh, but this was feasible, right? And the the, the very important hub knot of, of the question we made, I would say, multiple videos on it. Listen, that uh, we 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 introduced well everything at that point. Uh, the, uh, the 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 consequence here was between the reign of Henry VI and the death of Frederick the First. You know, his son was already associated to the throne before his father's death. But in in that sense, also the minority of Frederick the Second and all that that entailed for uh, for Sicily, for Germany, for for Europe, uh, as we have seen just recently, we were talking about the Battle of Bouvines and the struggle with the between the Swabians and the uh, the the Belfen, out of Brunswick, and how the broader international situation was tied to that to that uh, German struggle, but also to the the clash between the French and the English. Let's say better the Capetians and the Plantagenets to to be to be proper. Uh, and so, what happened in the 13th century uh, since since Frederick II's reign is that fundamentally the uh, royal authority let started to let things go, right? Uh, the edict in favor of the princes, famously issued by Frederick II, basically admitted that uh, public, uh, say, royal rights were, um, so the public estates were, in a sense, to, to be uh, exchanged, or to be traded in exchange for, for political power. Uh, the German market at that point began in, in the west of the Hohenstaufen to to deal uh, as you know other princes right as it had um, already been historically all the great uh, German houses that had risen to the to the Roman imperial throne were fundamentally endowed since look at the time of, you know since the the, the Ottonians, the Franconians, the Swabians, etc with very, you know, very consistent assets that made their power, made their power in an elective system for which uh, you were objectively always judged and, you know, as a consequence uh, depended heavily on the, the will of, 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 the, of the diet, of the, of the princely representatives that, in a way, were divided in their own in, in their own uh, turn, let's say, between the, the need of having a weak uh, monarch from one side that wouldn't uh, touch too much of their own prerogatives, but also, you know, a powerful one that could intervene in case somebody was usurping their own uh, prerogatives at the same time. And of course, uh, the major houses always competed for, for the same imperial, uh, same imperial crown. So, uh, 
as we've seen many times, all the, the question that was also resumed during the 19th century nationalist historiography that, ah, you know, the, the Swabians thought only about the Mediterranean, um, about uh, Italy and Sicily and, and, and the Holy Land, and they, they didn't care about Germany, they didn't work hard there, why would they, they right, you know, it was a, a place that fundamentally in their view would have just to become a, a peripheral province of a universal empire centered in, on Rome and, you know, con controlling fundamentally east and west, right? Uh, it was very difficult to dislodge with, with, a, with a mere German base, by the way, the same German ones, that the, 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 the private assets with these monarchies that this dynasty started with there, you know, would have allowed them to do. There, there were chances at, at a point, think about the struggle between Frederick I or Henry the Lion that have been interpreted as if, you know, at that point, if if the if Frederick had uh, seized the allodial uh, assets of Henry the Lion of the Belfin in Saxony, uh, a, a German national monarchy could have started. Well, if Frederick had done something like that, you know, it would have triggered a reaction that probably would have brought it might have brought objectively yes to to a reinforcement of properly the German basis of the monarchy, but by triggering um, again a, a a dramatic clash against the, the princes that would have said what the hell but, you know, those are our un that is our untouchable prerogative nobody can do that not even kings or emperors for that matter and so uh, the whole thing would have been fought in germany would have largely also affected the country in a way that and for what then you know for lands that mostly the, the richest ones were the ones of the rhineland and of southern germany and where you can you could actually cash much more much more administratively and uh, you know generally culturally developed areas like like northern Italy or the Kingdom of Sicily and so on and even taking the chance to seize Constantinople which Henry VI would have done objectively if he hadn't di died before eventually the French would do that uh, and would be close to do it again even after the Palaiologoi had recovered the city later on in the 13th century um, so the the um, you know, the bet here was very high, of course, uh, but it was perfectly sensible to pursue um, the Mediterranean policy, also because the same Belfan who rose to power, such as Otto IV, that had, up to that point, op you know, uh, been against, right, and, and uh, fought the same, uh, the Hohenstaufen policy uh, everywhere, as soon as they rose to the throne, they immediately went to Italy, the first thing they did, and so they were excommunicated in turn, and again, and that's all the, the thing with Bouvin, the alliance, with the English, and you know, and, and the French with with the Swabians, uh, is, is is the whole story. So, um, this great dream, the, the Mediterranean Chimera, was uh, that was was objectively that that's yet another thing we have to discuss because it's not so easy to say. Okay, well, yes, they they it, it, they went close to it, but you know, it, it to to achieve it, but fundamentally they. Still, they didn't. Still, they failed, and you have to understand there also why that happened, right? What what was constitutively there from a political, and even cultural point of view to to say why that dream eventually, you know, was 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 unreached, and uh, and Germany and the empire kind of revolved within themselves to to create a, a very different system from the one that was had had been seen before. And it was also quite recent, if you look at at least the, the, this. You know, would not necessarily recent, but it, it swung dramatically depending on the uh, German domestic affairs. So uh, another thing that is important to stress is that albeit the death of Frederick II brought to the you know relatively rapid demise of of the Hohenstaufen, uh, and the Great Interregnum wasn't a, a dramatically long thing, uh, but also the the same royal prerogatives in Germany were didn't you know didn't completely evaporate immediately because from one side uh, the the system still held in place right of course also the German princes as we were saying before had to earn to, to, to gain something from from the existence of a monarchy and of an imperial title uh, and at the same time the same princely houses were as we've seen uh, rooted you know on important assets that in this period they contributed to expand. So also what happened later 
at the end of the Middle Ages with the consolidation of important dynasties. First of all, the Habsburgs that start, in fact, at this point, but weren't that weak at the beginning, right? They, they were mostly weakened eventually by the split into dynastic lines during, you know, essentially the second half of the 14th, the first half of the 15th century. Um, but they actually reached important, you know, important power and important prestige also uh, outside of Germany. Um, and about the grand scale um, uh, Roman policy, right, the, the Romfart, the, the, um, the Italian expedition, was never resumed with the same greatness that, that had occurred in Swabian times, still that we'll see maybe better another time with Heroin the Seventh, we, we talked about it here and there at the beginning of the 14th century, but let's say it remained. Um, as a general horizon and broader ambition, independently from the fact that, yes, German power was kind of shrinking, but it's in, in capacity to, say, to wage war internationally, but at the same time also reinforcing in, in, a, in a system that was well entrenched in Central Europe, Central European affairs, and that still allowed this power to, to remain and to maintain. And the history of, of Germany in this sense is history of a, of a country that was hyper fragmented because it was factually not a country in Europe that was so you know intricately uh, there were like 300 states right or between you know uh, uh, feudal you know lordships cities states other you know leagues and other things like these um, but they um, it, it was factually never conquered right it was never a force in Europe that except from France that was mostly interested in the Rhineland and in the let's say uh, in the uh, you know in the lowlands more, more than else, um, and in Italy, uh, first and foremost, um, didn't quite come to to threaten, right? Nobody kind of thought ever to invade Germany. Like, I mean, not not even the same German kings as we have seen had conceived uh, at the peak of their power to extend their power properly in within Germany. So it was just not desirable. Um, for many reasons, that just because it was in fact uh, this intricate hell of uh, but of, of warlike uh, communities that you know, in, especially in the northeastern part, weren't even that you know economically profitable, except for you know some trade outposts where they they also managed to maintain their own power. But let's say also geographically, it was no major. The Scandinavian monarchies were weak. Uh, the Western Slavic ones also didn't have this. You know, Germany was too much of a of a tough nut to crack the, as we will see, Ottokar the second, the Promislets have this the stale strike at the moment. They, they they managed to seize the opportunity of the interregnum to dramatically develop their own power, almost come close to you know uh, to to get fundamentally the imperial power, and they were the, the most powerful princes in um, in the empire at that point. But um, fundamentally, these areas will, will remain also with the crisis of the mid 14th century onwards gradually, you know, kind of building from their own bases, right, their own boundaries, their own, which was also an orderly thing, right, the, the broader picture was a pretty me a mess, let's, to be honest, but at, at a local level, the administrative structures, the kind of, the development of political uh, identities and were, were quite orderly, right, this is something that is expressed quite clearly, even if, if you read Machiavelli, it was, you know, very... Uh, you know, he appreciated very much the, the, the German system at some point, um, and the and that made that kind of federalist mentality that still you know that that permeated uh, in, in 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 Central Europe and that up up to uh, you know up to today in a, in a certain sense, but that was a a clear manifestation of the ancien regime in its own primal form in a way up to fundamentally. World War the First, uh, in a, in a in a consistent fashion, in spite of for further subtle developments and so on. Well, th this moment is crucial in some regard. It's really impossible not to digress uh, on all the the topics we're touching now because the German 13th century is really dense and fragmented at the same time. So it, it requires properly this different mm, understanding of the, of the various uh, of the various polities that that operate in the sense domestically but also internationally right um, as you know when Frederick II died the German elector princes assigned uh, the crown of Germany to his son Conrad the fourth that after all had already been elected as king of the Romans since 1237 
uh, you know, things had gone bad, let's say, in Germany since, for example, the revolt of Henry the Seventh uh, against his own father. So Conrad was seen now as the kind of legitimate heir of that of that tradition. Uh, that uh, and it and as such, it was destined, right, as king of the Romans to bear also the imperial crown, right, that, that the king of the Romans would be a would, would be emperor, right, it was given green light for that by the German diet and then for, for, for pursuing this international policy, for which the same German princes, independently from their autonomies, in part benefited from, of course. And such crowns, as, as we well know, were elective, right, plus to them, uh, Conrad added the Sicilian one, right, by dynastic uh, inheritance. Um, that was quite another thing, as it was essentially, you know, almost something close to a national monarchy, right? It was very similar to, you know, in terms of centralization, together with the Kingdom of England was, uh, up to that point, had been uh, the, the most functional and also juridically advanced of the, uh, in terms of governance, etc., of, of the of the Latin Germanic kingdoms. There's no doubt about this. Things there, uh, since uh, Frederick the Second times had that made a gigantic effort to keep things together, had gone started to go a bit astray uh, because of all the wars that the same had been fought in this in the same Sicilian territory, the papal invasion, the the the, the baronial rebellions, and so on. And the, the, during the minority of Frederick the Second, this was kind of a camping uh, place for the, you know, the, the German ministerialists, the various, uh, you know, rule that, that came. Also, we'll talk about that more, more in detail. But, let's say, it had carved eff effectively some private lordships on their own, had began to, to shatter a little bit that, mm, importantly, unitary profile that had been given with, with energy and great effort by, by the Norman rulers back in the day. Um, and um, of course he, he inherited that land as a personal possession of the Hohenstaufen, right? It had inherited that by the marriage ties with the last heiress of the Hauteville. And um, so you understand also why the Mediterranean policy was so appealable because it, it, it it's a bit like I don't know there is a parallelism between this Norman monarchies because you see it's as if Sicily were to England what Germany was to France in this context right it's it's the idea that you have some like the Normans right think about uh, William the Conqueror later the, the Plantagenets and so on that properly had their original lands in France but then conquered this this kingdom on their own and they made it their own private possession so of course they preferred in a sense that one to their own French possession maybe in that case not so much because you know uh, the, uh, the 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 English so-called English barons as we've seen especially before Bouvin appreciated much more France than England for <laughs> for objective reasons uh, but uh, I, uh, here here it wasn't quite the case, like a German king that had also like a possession like an entire kingdom in one of the most fertile and, and advanced and developed countries in Europe at the time, would all, you know, with such clamorously uh, f favorable position in the center of the Mediterranean, they could invade the Byzantine Empire, they could launch, you know, have dramatically easier to launch crusades, they were close to Rome, etc., would want to, to rule from there, and, and they saw it as the major prize, and the papacy the, the whole deal of why the, the thing failed is that the papacy had always stood in between because they didn't want to be choked, right? Like in a pincer movement between Sicily and, let's say, uh, German Italy, because, uh, and, and that's why the struggle in Italy as well against the Hohenstaufen, and not just because of that, because of course the Italian communes wanted to, to maintain their own autonomy, if not de facto independence. And, um, and so they were always backed by also other international players that didn't want the Germans to become too powerful. Right, but juridically speaking, uh, the, the Hohenstaufen had a proper right on their own Sicilian uh, assets. So um, he, at, at this point, he he couldn't quite reach the island immediately because, as we will see now, in Germany things were were pretty messed up, and still uh, in Sicily it was a, a very important presence in the uh, figure of his half brother the legitimate son of Frederick II, Manfred, 
natural son of Frederick II. We will talk about him probably tomorrow because I'm making these things a bit in sequence. And so Manfred is one of, of the great figures of, of 13th century Europe and is often overlooked. He, in part, of course, in, in, uh, collected the Swabian legacy right of his father and in the fact that Again, as Frederick II had been the stupor mundi and the puer apulia, right? In these, uh, the, the Sicilian kingdom embodied this that that kind of greatness and you know, and and uh, and power and capacity. Actually, under Manfred, things were already going a bit um, downhill, to say the least. Um, there, there has been a lot of me. I, I personally love the Hohenstaufen. I the 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 Ghibelline dream. There is all the mystics behind that, but we we have to be careful. Also, historiographically, to first of all assess that the only two, you know, praiseable things written on Frederick II have been by, by Kantorowicz and uh, Abulafia, and that there is still an enormous lot to study about Frederick II, as my tutor says. Every time somebody searches again for about Frederick II, something new has come out. Um, and the um, and, and and still the, the greatness of these rulers, the, the magnificence of the court of Palermo, the, the you know the, the Sicilian poetry, the the, the scientific um, uh, uh, you know flourishing, uh, the, the center of Europe at this time, indeed uh, in this sense of prestige because of this emperor that was also in fact uh, you know uh, king of Jerusalem, king king of Sicily, and and all these his enormous power. He, speak all these languages has been seen as bit the greatest power ever in advancing everything and instead more updated historiography has seen that objectively even in, in the clash against the Lombard League etc even just for example from a technological point of view or just in terms of sheer wealth in, in, in invested in uh, military organization did, you know there wasn't that huge development that we think we, we keep underestimating especially the, the Italian communal uh, civilization in that regard we uh, we uh, in, a, in a sense uh, feel the need to if you want to stick to the model the great ruler and to the mod but it's not just that it, it's it doesn't fit just that that uh, that picture in any case under Manfred also things were going pretty pretty bad you think about the, the feudal system right of the Siculo Norman kingdom at this point was evaporated like Manfred factually fought with German mercenaries right and uh, and also the economy wasn't uh, to you know the, the country had been shattered things were difficult to keep together and also we'll see the international situation wasn't the most florid but and the, the death of Frederick the second of course had brought given a, a dramatic blow to the situation and there was this ambiguity like you know yes Conrad is the heir is the legitimate heir and son of Frederick but Sicily is ruled factually by his half brother a natural son of, of, of his father I'd say um, as we will see uh, Germany however was more important right the the, the Hohenstaufen had to protect first and foremost in a sense and unavoidably their own uh, Swabian lands um, and if Conrad could count largely on the southern German mobility uh, he had um, powerful enemies in the uh, mercantile cities of the Rhine, and especially the ones of the great electors, right? Mainz, Trier, Köln, that uh, since 1247 had joined in a R Rhenish league, and that for their trade uh, aimed mostly as a as a general direction to the North Sea, right where the the, the great river Rhine flows, uh, the one of the the great um, one of the major communication routes of Germany so projecting themselves to a world that was more like the one of northern Europe right think about the important ties of with England that also Saxon in fact the Welfen had embodied so that's the other direction that also German nationalism said ah look at the Hansa look at the Teutonic Knights that, that's the area well because in the you know so later on with the idea of Germany having to earn its Lebensraum in, in, in the in the east that was the the the, the connect but it, reality was kind of much different as we were seeing before and um, the sound in Germany was crucial for the Swabians first of all because they, they were Swabian themselves so also properly at the border with Alsace Switzerland they, they, they came that that was the environment um, and then because they needed the Alpine passes for their for their for their Italian policy 
uh, and also for the wealth to derive from it. In fact, uh, we'll see it also the rise of the Swiss Confederacy, the wealth of the Swiss countries had started under Frederick II and had built new routes of communication, bridges, pa passes, uh, pathways, let's say, um, and uh, you know, provided autonomy with these, with these uh, shepherds that had you know, enriched also. Uh, as a consequence, and developed in part of the interreg, you know, exploited interregnum and all these things. It was a feudal rule, right? The one of the Hohenstaufen, the most, you know, sound that you can imagine. Then Austria, as well, that was very important because Austria was not uh, uh, conquered by the Hohenstaufen, but you know, already Frederick II had, you know, looked at it because of the Babenberg um, uh, dynastic. Uh, inheritance that there was being, uh, you know, uh, looked at and by by many competitors, and that eventually would be the one of the Permisleys, the one of the Habsburgs, uh, definitely, and that would have, in this sense, closed the Alpine passes had been, you know, seized uh, altogether as Frederick II wanted to do. It. That was the his great plan in Germany, but essentially surrendering public rights, you know, in exchange for for this factual power. And it had always been like that. It's just that now, properly, Frederick II had actually, and just like Conrad, etc., they had all in the, the later monarchs. They always took very seriously, as Germans themselves, their role of German kings. Right? It's just that up to, you know, the time of Frederick, Frederick II wore different masks. Right? He had a mask as, as you know, king of Sicily, as one of his king of Italy, and other as king of Germany, uh, one other as, as a crusader, and so on. Because he needed to cope with all these different communities, but indeed he loved Germany and he felt very much the, the, the pride standing from from this monarchic uh, for the monarchic role and from the the, the honor and the, the that it was. So uh, we will never talk enough about Frederick II, but for today's video he's dead already. So we're talking about already his um, his legacy, indeed. And um, the um, while, as we've seen, there's this other cities instead in the because traditionally southern Germany is, is is the richest, right? You know, it's the area that had you know, kind of closer to civilization. Uh, together with the Rhineland, it was Romanized, was you know an area that maintained it's still in Germany today that it's deeply felt, right? You know, what was the boundary between you know understanding that there is a deep divide between somebody even maybe living few tens of kilometers away that whoever was not falling to the, the the imperial border that they hadn't seen that that kind of culture that there were more fertile lands in the south uh, they and again closer to you know the, to, to the Mediterranean for this broader policy uh, the, the the communities of the north had been more recent if you want right had been the ones who had in, in, in relative terms had grown faster in the this great moment in the 12th and 13th century great this massive expansion demographic economical one uh, that especially the Germans had pioneered even towards in fact the north the east and so on and this looked at mostly at um, as everybody to their own interests that of course were the ones of a kind of more autonomous dimension right it was not so fully dynast you know feudalized and dynasticized even though of course it was a bit the same but um, think it even about the for fortunes of the Hansa, we'll see at the end, you know, those derived even from objective, not just a Scandinavian weakness, but also kind of a weak, uh, German, uh, a royal German weakness at some point, especially in the north, it was more distant to, to uh, for rich, the great dynasties it would form now were mostly gravitating, uh, in fact, around the Rhineland, but mostly eventually in southern Germany, and so never, it was never like a northern monarchy that assumed kind of a leading role in, in, in this picture. It was always either, in fact, the Habsburgs, then the Luxembourgs, with starting from the, the western French end of, 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 of the empire to settling in Bohemia. It was something more more unitary in nature. But also the, yeah, the, the Vatin were important. Also the Hohenzollern would rise, but they never, never reached uh, in this period any kind of substantial significance. And by the way, they the, the Swabians, the Hohenzollern, the Absolute, they all came from Swabia, 
by the way. So that tells it a lot. There is also something social and military about that, meaning that by the 13th century, southern Germany, uh, um, southern German knights were by 90% ministerialists that were essentially these, by that century, essentially equal to any other knight in everything except their juridical status. Sometimes they were even more powerful than free noble, free noblemen, but and they they were kind of more. Mm, kind of loyal to the imperial cause because they were kind of public knights right and so they 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 embodied a yeah still local interests in a way but at the same time they they were uh they, they, their fortune in part did depend from a from a strong central power and their possibility and in fact they had been mostly proper even in the Rhineland of the ecclesiastical principalities of, of powers that had historically in Germany been associated to allied with, with 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 royal with imperial rule as well in the, in the 13th century this this dichotomy was blurred because also the ecclesiastical principalities as we've seen also in the video about the rise of philip the swabian otto of, of brunswick were you know an inch that they weren't doing that anymore and that's because yeah things were going dramatically downhill from a from a public institu institutional point of view and so Conrad had this, uh, this problem in, you know, coping with essentially the, the the Rhenish League because they were some of the most powerful cities in the empire, and they had also mm, by themselves very close contacts with the county of Holland, that was living at that point an important expansion in fortune, even here not a dramatic power as we will see now, uh, but still enough to to tip the balance right in in uh, in, in the country. Uh, the Count William of Holland had uh, had been offered by the Rhenish League the crown of Germany already in 1248. Again, he had been chosen not because of what much of a powerful rule, but because you know it was mostly out of the uh, Swabian gain. And this had happened 1248, as you understand, when Frederick II was still alive. So Conrad had here several. There were wars taking place he you know managed in a way to settle matters in germany in a satisfactory way and uh, except you know he wouldn't control the whole country and so he just maintained a status quo um he 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 he, um, he, he didn't uh, the, the interesting thing at this point is that there were different kings of the romans at the same time because we were elected by different electors at the same time so conrad um you know kind of let the thing go albeit never um, granting William of Holland uh, formal royal prerogatives, of course, and he tried again to pursue the Italian, um, the Italian uh, uh, way, and and this was in a sense natural, as we've seen, because he, as king of the Romans uh, and and king of the Germans, he was expected in a sense to to get the the Holy Roman Imperial crown. And he, however, couldn't quite cross into into Italy safely. He simply went to uh, Venice at that point and embarked for for the kingdom for, for for Apulia. Fundamentally, he landed there and he began to seize control of the country. And in the process, he fought with his half brother Manfred. He even restrained him. Um, here, negotiations with the papacy naturally were started because. Uh, of the of the imperial crowning, but also of the of the problem now that was posed again that the king of, of Germany would would again try to reunite that its own Sicilian possession. Um, so the papacy initially was you know negotiating as well because there were some you know anti papal nobility in in Sicily that you know he wanted to take out and Conrad also needed those men to rule the country and and so he displaced the the pope. So he was excommunicated, and he died in 1254 without having managed essentially to secure the uh, you know the, the crowns or leaving it to a to to a heir. Also because his um, his son right, was uh, Conrad, known as Conradine, and uh, you know what we were talking about was only two years old at the time, and he was entrusted uh, by himself actually by the same Conrad. To the protection of Pope Innocent IV. This was also another tradition. Think about Frederick II with Innocent III, and you know, and, and the other Pope. Like the idea of 
you know, nurturing this uh, would-be emperor that would have to, to essentially operate as a papal protector in turn had he been instructed adequately since childhood. The situation here was something very, very, very different now. And you know who Conradin is, we will talk about him soon, um, uh, as we never made a video about that that further passage, we will we'll talk about it probably tomorrow, S speaking of Manfred and, you know, the, eventually the, the conquest of Sicily by Charles of Anjou and the Battle of Tagliacozzo and the death of Conradin, all these things. Today we stick to Germany, however, so um, the... The, the situation wasn't, of course, uh, significantly improved um, uh, at, at that point uh, with the death of Conrad and the minority of his son. So, William of Holland was also assassinated in 1256. The year after the Swabian partisans, the, the Ghibellines, chose as king and candidate to the empire a foreign ruler. Uh, Alfonso X of Castile, great legislator, a bit who embodied a bit that great uh, model of universalistic sovereign that by the 13th century you can find in Frederick II, in Louis IX, in Henry III, like he was the, the Spanish one, the Castilian one. And his great grandfather was Frederick Barbarossa because uh, he was son of a, of a daughter of Philip, uh, Philip of Swabia, son of, of Frederick Barbarossa. Um, and he was, uh, of course, the Germans were choosing him, you know, it was a very prestigious title for, for Alfonso to accept, but he never actually set foot in Germany. The Germans just wanted to have a, a distant ruler, who didn't, or at least somebody who didn't have any kind of rooting at that point in the country. That gives you a bit the idea of the anarchy, if you want, that was reigning in, in, in the thing. Because you have to imagine, every time uh, a German king died, uh, you imagine the messenger running, you know, to 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 these German castles in the forest, etc. Uh, beautiful landscape, and you know, he the guy arrived. You can imagine the whole, the, the news were uh, announced, and so the Lord in his in his uh, you know court and 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 relatives and retinues would look at each other and say, "Yay!" And then you have to imagine afterwards, you know, the the countryside devastated, flames. Shouts, devastation, knights running around, destroying, pillaging, plundering, and because that was effectively the thing. Every time uh, this uh, label power that that was the German monarchy uh, evaporated, and then and, and everything was in the hands of of the electors, and at that point, all the public rights, that is to say, you know, certain estates, certain lands, certain prose the emperor had, it were fundamentally usurped. With war, with seizure, with invasions, with conquest, and so uh, it was a total mess, and, and it was convenient for many of these dynasties to, to, pro to, you know, to capitalize, of course, from, from this situation. Now, this was from uh, Alfonso the Tent, in this sense, embodied a bit uh, like the Swabian side, as we've seen, that elected him for, for, for these various reasons. The Valfen instead, the Guelphs, um, turned to Richard III of Cornwall, brother of Henry III of England, who boasted instead a uh, blood tie with the uh, ducal house of Saxony, as you know, the, the Plantagenets had married into the development. And uh, so historically, it was a bit the same thing, like, yeah, I mean, Alfonso embodied a bit more that, uh, if you want, continental, even Mediterranean connection, not just because he was, you know, married into the Swabians himself, but also um, at that point he had important ties in Italy. He backed Ezzelino da Romano in, in northeastern Italy as imperial vicar that had been made as such by Frederick II. Uh, he never quite had this dramatic reach, nor as we've seen, nor on Italy nor on Germany per se, but he was an influent, powerful ruler, so, um, you know, he embodied that tradition. It, the the Valfon would historically choose like the other side, the, the northern one, in this sense, the insular English power with whom Saxony had had important, even economic interests uh, in common and so on. So that was the logic, by the way. And Herod, um, excuse me, uh, Richard Cornwall was, um, was he went to Germany just twice. Like he, he was, uh, actually Alfonso the, the, the tent from, from Spain managed to, 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 to interfere more with German affairs than uh, Richard did. Uh, he, uh, he was 
famously very impressive the the warlikeness of german bishops so that there is a letter in which he writes to to his brother henry like oh uh, well you know there are these german bishops are so warlike we should create them in england as well <laughs> like like them um, but the truth, in fact, is that this was the interregnum. This was a situation where, factually, no real ruler stood, even properly from a physical point of view, in Germany. Um, so both sides counted as Germans on the prestige and the fascination of imperial crown. Right? They they thought. Um, would have induced in those two non-German princes to deal with, you know, the the the, the quite uh, thorny ma affairs of of the German kingdom. Um, but doing anything, right, uh, to to give anything in exchange for rising to sit on the throne that had been of Otto the, the Great and, and and of Frederick Barbarossa. But indeed. As we've seen many times, at this point, uh, the idea of the empire had lost much of its universalistic charm, say. As especially it was ever, ever clearer that to it was not connected any effective power, except the one that the, those would have been elected to, to imperial dignity could have on, on their own, as we've seen, but through their private fortunes. Now this is important in, in a broader, in a broader conception of the of the matter, because of course the empire was called to literally rule the world, right? So if you have, um, in theory, based on an empire where the emperor doesn't even rule in the place where it should be ruling from, like there is, you know, there is something wrong with that. And of course the, you know, the, the Swabians had struggled pretty much to maintain the thing alive, but they were. Hell, they, they, they were a, a, a damned dynasty, right? You know, Frederick I died the way we know, a drone in, during the Crusade. Um, Philip uh, of Swabia was assassinated. Henry VI also prematurely died before conquering Constantinople. Um, Frederick II died defeated fundamentally of this century, having failed against the, the papacy, the Lombard League, and so on. Um, uh, Heinz, king of, of Sardinia, uh, his son was... Uh, was captured by the Bolognese after his defeat uh, uh, in, in northern Italy and spent his lifetime imprisoned in a tower. Uh, Henry, the rebel son of Frederick II, con got leprosy, I mean, had rebelled to his father, got leprosy, and he suicided himself by falling off of a, of a cliff, throwing himself off a cliff not to be, to live in prison. Um, Conrad, as we've seen, failed in his in enterprise. Manfred would die killed at, at at uh, Benevent. Um, Conradin would be beheaded after being defeated at Tagliacozzo by Charles of Anjou on the Marsk Square of Naples. I mean, they were, I mean, the, the, the Orange Southern lived on through the female line, but in fact, that, that, that doesn't count in that regard. And, uh, but it, you understand that here, uh, all the people who had hated them at the point of making them make that, that end at the end of the day. So they were very unlucky in many ways but they also had had their fortunes and so that that was the gamble and history is really unpredictable in the way it goes and so the the story of this dynasty had object had caused an enormous uh, upheaval in europe i mean all the the struggle between the guelphs and the ghibellines the broader international situation the crusade i mean uh, it was it, it, it was a clash over universal power right in and this triggered enormous forces at that point was a were able to to counter each other at this point and uh, the swabians were the ones that were the side who lost so what we talk uh, in terms of the long great interregnum is this period between 1256 and uh, 1272 so this is basically um between the the assassination of, of William of Holland and the rise of Rudolf of Habsburg, and in fact, um, this this is the moment in which we assist to the rise of this, you know, initially modest indeed, um, comital feudal power of of the South, originally of an area that corresponds to to a part of today's Switzerland. It is the one of the in fact the counts of Habsburg. The Habsburgs 
are one of the single most noble families in Europe that we, we miss just genealogically one chain of uh, one, one ring of the chain something around I think the, the 9th or, or the 10th century for which we were pretty sure otherwise that the, the Habsburgs actually descended from a Roman Burgundian senatorial family right and that gives you a dimension of how powerful these men were uh, across this this era it was very uh, very interesting you know between essentially the as we've seen Elsa's Switzerland Burgundy and that had risen to power they were quite modest actually as such they stayed loyal to the Swabians they were Swabians themselves I mean to the Hohenstaufen and they um, they gradually rose to, to a power that initially was not really thought as much because objectively the county of Habsburg was, was not a great one of the greatest houses of Germany at all but this figure of Rudolf of Habsburg um, that I really admire enormously also because I wrote a master thesis about him there I can say it um, is um, you know w was the one of a very lucid capable skilled cold ruler uh, a great um, calculator indeed who managed to exploit basically every kind of opportunity that took and taking all the risks but you know very lucidly again in very scientifically we could say exploiting also the rise of mendicant orders of, of the cities in some, in some instances um, and of um, still however maintaining this very strong feudal legacy and you know and he, um, spiritually almost the the same Swabian one, right? You know, the, the what the Hohenstaufen had created at that point was properly a, mi a myth, right? Everybody wanted to be their, their successors you know, at that point, weren't just like a house like all others, right? So, especially after Frederick II, Rudolf had an interesting life, right? In his youth, he fought uh, to, to defend his, uh, you know, his assets and also, you know, serving loyally the Hohenstaufen and his brother had died in Italy against the Lombard League under Frederick II uh, when Conradin descended into Italy he he went there to 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 deal you know what, what the situation would have had to, to be uh, in Swabia in the meanwhile he he saw all the all these if you look at this man's life even just chronologically um, he, he he went through some of the most important turning points of, of, of the, the the time in you know, German policy in the, in the Empire. Who knows what he actually thought? He was very deeply devoted, um, and in fact, he had almost uh, he set a bit that's Habsburgic standards of a, a quasi monastic lifestyle, right? You know that that stemmed from this, uh, you know, banally from 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 the fact that the Habsburgs were never quite rich even in later times, nor they could actually boast any, you know, greater nobility or ties or, let's say, sanctity, for example, in their dynasty, differently from the French. Like, they, they were able to, to build uh, a figure of themselves based on their actions. This, this, this is really important. So Rudolf um, was, um, was uh, essentially... Uh, you know, a papal creation by a certain degree because um, it was Gregory the Tent who deposed Alfonso the the Tent of, of Castilla at that point and allowed um, Rudolf to rise. Um, part of the reason is of of this is that there are really many, right? I'm, I'm making the story really simple because it's really intricate. But to make the long story short, at this point the Angevins had already conquered southern Italy, so the papacy that had backed them exactly against German power, began to veer, albeit remaining essentially allied with the French, you know, more in favor of, of, of German policy that still was, um, uh, you know, that, that could, in this sense, counter the, this broader, um, you know, uh, system internationally, but also had important things to say about the Italian policy and especially all those assets that um, that uh, that still the, the papacy had contended to the empire in central and northern Italy since a very long date. Essentially, Rudolf was elected because he agreed to, um, in exchange to to grant those those lands in um, to the papacy for good. Um, and so that's, for example, the papacy came to power gradually in places like Bologna in 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 the Romagnol areas and so on. 
uh, for, for good, right? It would become permanently part of the papal states. Um, this naturally shows how weak at that point any German monarch was really to be to, to rise in these ways. Uh, anyhow, Rudolf got the German crown and eventually the one of the Romans, as we've seen. Um, and Rudolf um, is uh, one of the great, one of the most successful figures in in in, in medieval history in that sense because he uh, managed from a very modest power. Right to strip the Premislets, the the kings of Bohemia, of the uh, the the lands of Austria, uh, Styria, and Carinthia, and and other various places up to technically even Pordenone and in northeastern Italy, and so up to the Adriatic, that had been conquered by by them, by Ottokar II, that was uh, the splendid ruler of Bohemia. An incredibly powerful individual. It's the name after which the city of Königsberg was was named after during his um, campaign in, in in the Baltic against the pagans. Uh, he was a great centralizer of Bohemia. He founded many cities, um, um, of royal privilege, and you know, in that sense, trying to counter nobiliar power. Uh, as you know, he had actually risen to power without nobiliar rebellion when he was young against his father, and he knew what the danger was. And he, in fact, as a, as a king tried to uh, to curb it actually who had made this very shrewd policy marrying the uh, Margaret the, the Harris the last Harris of the Babenbach so the, the 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 ruling dynasty of Austria and eventually repudiating her but let's say in the process becoming adding to Bohemia this other very rich and important lands in in southeastern Germany right and becoming factually the larger the greatest power in Germany so at that point Rudolf was backed by uh, by the German nobility at large that saw in Ottokar a threat, and he uh, launched his first campaign against uh, Austria in 1276. It was actually a, a double a pincer movement. Um, the Habsburgs were at this point he, Rudolf his son for, for, were famous for for forced marches, right? And he had made a trick, you know, trying to invade Bohemia from the west, and then instead he attacked quite quickly with a swift march uh, to Vienna. And he managed to take over the whole Austria at that point. Two years after, um, he had lost German support because you know he had become the most powerful one uh, uh, that to, to to fear. And so he was al essentially alone, together with a few of his good Swabians, though, and uh, the Austrian uh, nobility. It was not enough, but backed importantly by by, by Hungary, like La Ladislas the, the Fort. Uh, with his Kumans, as he was half Kuman himself as king of Hungary, um, as his mother was a, a Kuman princess, and who jointly crushed uh, uh, the the Bohemian army together with his German mercenaries and uh, Polish allies at Markfeld at the Battle of Dürnkrut und Jerenspägen uh, on the march uh, on the Morava um, that uh, was the largest battle of feudal knights in medieval history. Nobody actually cares about it. I, I wrote an entire master thesis on it. Uh, it's one of the most beautiful things that ever happened to me, also because I visited the battlefield. It was just like a per pilgrimage, spiritual experience, and I will tell it, uh, about it at some point. It's something astonishingly beautiful. And with the Battle of Markfeld, Ottokar died on the field, um, so uh, the the Habsburgs rose to an incredible power. They marched into Bohemia, and eventually they settled matters with the Brandenburgers because they had marched as well in Bohemia. There was all a dynastic situation there that um, had brought um, the 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 marker of Brandenburg to 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 properly kidnap Ottokar's wife and children. Uh, but um, Rudolf managed to to retake control of the situation, and so that's how the Habsburgs, as a small Swiss counts fundamentally became um, what we know as one of the greatest Central European powers, and especially at that time, right? Summoning all these uh, this possessions in Swabia, in uh, in Austria, in Styria, in Carinthia, and Tyrol, in in other surrounding lands, and establishing that that uh, core lands from which eventually the Habsburgs would have you know uh, expanded historically. And at this point, they they had, as you understand, a huge power that stretched uh, across all southern Germany, and that was invested 
sensibly. Uh, you know, there, there were some moments in which fundamentally the, the there were some dynastic ties with the heirs of the Permisleds at some point. The Habsburgs would even bear the Bohemian and the Polish crown in those years, right? Not later, when, of course, Bohemia was eventually incorporated. Um, but um, there, there was even this thing. It was a formal recognition. never came to rule over Poland. But that gives you the, the idea of the, of the authority they had at that point. Uh, Rudolf spent his... Um, the rest of his life essentially fighting in the Rhineland, destroying, I don't know, as many as 70 castles to try to bring order again, to reestablish this public authority, which, in which they still believed by the 70s, the 80s, of the of the 13th century, and that, however, was kind of worth, uh, you know, a, a fruitless effort, because it, it was just too big, like the, uh, Germany was like a blob, right, it was something, you know, you, you could take one thing away, but it would, the other Problems would, would would rise again, and there were always new ones. And the international situation didn't help either. Um, the um, so, but the important thing is that Austria was settled by the Habs, you know, the the, uh, the of which they assumed the ducal title and becoming the uh, the 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 center of the familiar hereditary power. Other years, and. Uh, and it was exactly thanks to the safe possession of Austria that the Habsburgs, after a parenthesis between 1292 and 1298, given that Rudolf had died, the German crown was entrusted to Adolf of Nassau, uh, who, um, who clashed um, uh, importantly against Albert, uh, Rudolf's son, and in fact, uh, you know, he eventually surrendered power to him, or at least, you know, he eventually died, but, you know, the, the next ruler... Uh, on on the throne was Albert from 1298 to 1308. Um, and the new German kings, however well aware of the fact that their powers were in reality strongly limited, both by feudal aristocracies and the mercantile cities, they didn't try, they didn't even try to start uh, an Italian politics, uh, policy, as it had been the norm instead for their predecessors between the 10th and the 13th century. They would have liked to, right? They, that that was always tried politically, right? To set the you know conditions for launching the the, the campaign, because again, that was the the most sensible thing to do. Italy was overwhelmingly rich and overwhelmingly fragmented from a political point of view. So what what a better target than that? But uh, at that point, Germany was as turbulent, and um, and lots of changes were being triggered that that would make German rulers very careful and, and you know, and, and, and aware of what was going on there, not to ever lose control of their affairs, because they their power prim primarily depended on it at that point. Uh, Sicily was no more. I mean, you know, it was taken by the Angevins, right? So eventually, um, Henry VII would try to invade Naples. It would have even been possible to reconquer it at some point, telling the truth. But this, was, this wouldn't eventually happen. So even in here, there is n nothing really deterministic about it. Things could have gone differently, but uh, again, it, it's more important to understand why they went differently than saying, but what if, right? Because that's unfortunately not that's something we'll never know. Um, so these are the most important, uh, say, royal events, let's say. Um, but um, there were also many other uh, many other dynamics. Germany was quite polymorphic, we would say, uh, and quite rising. Germany at this point was was booming, right? What uh, had um, was booming paradoxically, even in the crisis, like the 13th century had been. I mean, I'm talking about the heart of the 13th century. It was the great century of the the Minnesota. It was the 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 colonization of the East. It was the you know, was this uh, the, the colonization was very important, but led especially by the, by the the Markgrafs of Brandenburg and the um, uh, warrior monks of the Teutonic Order, right? In, in those same years, uh, the, the Prussia up to the uh, Oda was uh, conquered and Germanized, right? And also the Huns, the so-called Huns, or Hanseatic League, was founded. It was a sort of commercial feder feder federation, let's say, and commercial and military confederacy between mercantile cities of the 
North and Baltic Sea. So we're talking mostly about Hamburg, Bremen, Lübeck, uh, Stettin, um, that thanks to their union, they managed to monopolize uh, a very rich trade uh, in the north and the traffics between Russia, the Scandinavian Peninsula and Europe. And the Hanseatic League, as we were saying before, is, is one of the most f famous you know, trade unions, we could say, of the of the Middle Ages, it was, um, uh, you know, it, it made its own civilization, its own regard, yet um, it, it, it should also be framed in this context. As we were saying before, the, the, the reason why these cities rose to power was connected to this broader expansion towards the, the east, the, the, the north, in the Baltic. Lübeck was founded properly by seigneurial power after it had gone destroyed in, in the original settlement in the wars between, among the Slavs. There was this kind of engineering, like of creating new towns in a strategic way, the trade and so on. But this broader um, liquefaction of, of, of royal power brought, of course, these centers to prosper their own way, because there was, um, there were, what is interesting, we will talk about the Lubeck um, and the Magdeburg laws, etc., all these autonomies that were given to these cities, because technically, you know, the answer existed, not like a sovereign power, it's just a union, right? So uh, these cities could still be within a seigneurial power of some sort, right? The relations that existed with any other community around were very complex, very, very articulated, they overlapped and so on. But the real strength of these cities was, in a way, strategic, meaning that there were proper towns with walls located often in, you know, in, in the north of Germany, you know, among marshes, the rivers, the, the, the sea, the, the, it wasn't, they weren't easy, right, to storm in each and every one of them. Um, they, they were rich, so they had the material wealth that could afford them also this kind of defense and so on, but it's important that they were towns, however, and that their strength actually came from their union, right? They, these weren't like true city-states, like you pick Venice, for example, that creates like really a state on its own with a large military, a large navy that is properly a power on its own regard. These, these towns have their strength in the fact that they are associated, right? And they're, they, they blackmailed, they, they did a lot of interesting things. So they had their own piracy, of course, they raided at some point, even, I don't know, Copenhagen and, and other, you know, um, uh, they, they were quite bullying on, on their own regard. They had their own things to say in the Teutonic order, in, in, but I don't know, if the King of England didn't want to trade with one of them for some reason, because he wanted to bully one of those towns instead, they, they would all in block, right, sabotage, the, the 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 trade with England, so that had immediately say, wait, 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 slow down, and I won't do it anymore. So that that was their modus operandi, right? But as soon as towards the end of the Middle Ages, the early modern age, the Scandinavian monarchies, you know, became you know more solid powers, and you know also the the German policy was kind of more consistent. Uh, you see, the town itself doesn't survive the rise, the, the rise of states, even as modest sometimes as the ones of Northern Europe f were, right? And, and so this, this is an important lesson because we, we look with sympathy as modern people as, you know, ah, the, the entrepreneuriality, the, you know, the charter city, all these things. But fundamentally, right, uh, these were the losers of history, right? They, they made a lot of money at some point, yes, but they, did they came to rule eventually the world? No, they didn't. Uh, and they didn't because they didn't form into a real state. Right, they quarreled constantly against each other as well. There were basically four different chunks of the, the various, you know, the areas, the various sections of the Hanseatic the, the League that couldn't really look at each other very favorably. They they threw other powers at each other and all these things, but properly, uh, they they also remained fundamentally towns. That that's it. So uh, doesn't matter how much capital they they accumulated. Eventually, they they wouldn't know how to invest it in, in something of a greater scale. Not even the Italian city-states would manage that, even though they had created real states on their own. The great monarchies like France, like Spain, like, in a sense, even the Habsburgs, right, were something bigger, more powerful. So we, we have to, to reflect also how the, uh, the, the, the civilization passes through powers that are not necessarily more sympathetic towards you know, democracy, right? You, you can argue that, of course, even the Renaissance, you know, uh, in that sense we've seen, the Wars of Italy, Italy kind of loses its own uh, autonomy, but still has a dramatic economical, artistic, scientific output of, of, of 
enormous magnitude. Um, but uh, at that point, still, they, they wouldn't evolve into something else at that point because they had maintained the, mostly the, the mercantile model over over statal policy. So you can imagine even an Asiatic town how limited in that sense c can be. But it, it, it's also worth noticing that places like Bremen, like uh, Hamburg, they, they, they are still cities, uh, city-states. I mean, they're still independent in their own mindset, right? But this is the same mindset, I don't know, of the Greek city-states thought to be still independent while being factually conquered by the Roman Empire. Um, it, it's this idea of freedom I can tell you because I, I, I was I fell in love with the Anseatic cities. Right, if you go, if you visit them, Lübeck, Bremen, Hamburg, um, I visit I don't know Rostock. There are there are different, many ones because they weren't just a few. They they weren't just in Germany, by the way. Right, some of them reached also far in you know in the England through the rivers. Some were in in other countries. Even in the Mediterranean, Naples was for for example a. A member of the, the Anseatic League, so it was again. You have to understand that the, the boundaries here involved, um, and, and so that spirit of independence that I that I breathed, even reading the, in those uh, city halls and that the, that vision of power, probably the sense of you know free like the wave that here uh, it brought you, and and steady like the, the pillar here built it, this is this was if i'm not wrong in uh, in hamburg uh, i've seen that oh, i don't remember actually but i will let you know if you are interested like that, that gives you properly the idea of what, what freedom is meant in, in a civilizational sense but at the same time yeah that that's like a, co a cognitively dissonant view in 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 the measure in which eventually would it come to rule right it, the, the most feudal of those powers that weren't even german like the Austrians or the Prussians fun fundamentally built their own powers, even outside of that kind of federalist reality as they came to rule in other countries like Hungary, like Poland, um, in a very, w with iron fist as well. So where does civilization lay? Does it lay in just in the rationalistic, intellectualistic side of the story, the, you know, the, the idea of, of freedom in, by, by itself? Does it lay properly in those who would Tramute that in action by conquering and ruling and you know knowing what it means to govern much more complex systems and how much you know civilization is actually made by those so that's always my my take in it and it's a struggle because I instinctively we are more sympathetic towards the uh, that that previous model but uh, we we underestimate how much we can do whether we we understand the greatness of the other if we are, have the courage and the strength to, to be the ones we have to take on that kind of responsibility. So um, this is maybe, you know, a, a provocative note to end this video, but I hope to have given at least a uh, very, uh, by sketchly and broadly, a, a decent picture of what, what, what happened from a dynastic point of view. And believe me, it's a mess, right? It's a mess because here is just a manualistic introduction to the period, right? But if you were to study at this point by the 13th century, especially the, the amount of sources that you start handing are enormous. Just uh, for the Battle of Markfeld, I, I I worked for six months in a row, uh, or even more. Like it, it, so, and that that's basically a single campaign in battle. You can figure the whole German history for 100 years, right? It starts being enormous, and that's why also as historians we have to recognize our human limits, even though we would like to be like the again the Nikephoroi that <laughs> that are invested by by the uh, the celestial power of 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 of, of glory and military and command, let's say faculty of command. But it, it it's important because as a as a complex system it teaches you to be wary of the complexity and also the interdependence of all the systems right so i hope we'll talk about germany more um we'll surely do i still have to find some decent base for talking about also especially the 14th and the 15th century i think are very overlooked in german history but anyhow uh, for today we stop it here I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like. 
or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.